Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast on the Rigor Podcast Network is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Their technology and tools make hiring more efficient and effective. The smartest way to hire. Powerful technology scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience for your job. The tech doesn't stop there, my friends. It even learns what kind of candidate you like and invites more to apply. So effective, 80% of employers will post on ZipRecruiter to get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. My listeners, you, you're my listener. You can try it for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash BS. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. We're also brought to you by our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. They are excited to introduce their all new rate shield approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, rate shield approval is a real game changer. And here's why. First, Quicken Loans will lock your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. But here's the crucial part. If rates go up, your rate stays the same. If rates go down, your rate also drops. Either way, you win. It's that kind of thinking you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender to get started. Go to rocketmortgage.com slash Bill Simmons. Don't forget to check out theringer.com as well as the Ringer Podcast Network where we have all kinds of phenomenal multimedia content for you. By the time you hear this, I am going to be on, on the smooth waves of Florida, Florida, what the hell am I doing in Florida? Oh, wait, I went to see my buddy Gus at full sale. Shout out to everybody at full sale. Uh, coming up a big announcement from our first guest. I'll leave it a mystery. That's ah, in the title. You know who it is. Ryan Rosillo, an announcement from him. And then I have two children, Zoe and Ben, and then I have an unofficial third child. My man, Jason Tatum, came on the podcast. That's coming up first, Pearl Jam. All right, Ryan Russell is on the line. This was short notice. We could not get him to drive all the way from his palatial estate on, in South Bay all the way to our offices. But he is on the line. And more importantly, he's going to be joining the ringer and working with us on a new podcast named by Ryan Rosillo. What's the name, Ryan? Uh, it's called the ESPN 10-Day Contract <laughs> no, Podcast. You didn't suggest that one. That's oh, actually not about 10-Day Contract oh. is a good title. <laughs> uh, the dual threat because I'm going to be doing pro football, college football, and uh, because I'll be working with you guys too, which I think is the coolest part about all of this coming together in the last week or so that everyone was like, oh my gosh, you stayed at ESPN. You're like, yep, and this. Yeah. So um, can I just get out of the way and tell you thank you? I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. We're so, I'm so happy this finally worked out. We've known each other for a long time. We had a lot of fun working together at ESPN. You you co-hosted a Grantland basketball hour with me. What was that? Like the fourth or fifth episode? Way back, it was like four years ago. Yeah, I got ago. in early. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was funny because I remember Zach came on and the idea was if Zach tanked, then I was going to be on all of them. And then I watched and I was like, oh, Zach's pretty good. Yeah. I was, and I was, <laughs> yeah, but I, I was like, bad. I felt <laughs> <laughs> You're rooting against Zach. Uh, yeah, so we're I was like, oh, they're going to use him more. Yeah. So we're All going right. with dual threat. We should mention um, runner runner ups for the pod. Runner up for names. We had uh, they and they weren't even good runner ups. But what was what was the one? West Coast Defensive was one of them. What what was the other one? West Coast Rosillo was another one. West Coast Defensive. I didn't quite get. And then we were going to do first and friends, but I didn't know that I could come up with enough friends to deliver on that. Um, I'd like I to- sent you a list. You know, you just <laughs> first and friends sounded like a uh, rival to Good Morning Football on the NFL Network. It was like some other channel had their rival morning show, First and Friends, but it, maybe it's like on Fox. I don't know. Yeah, then I thought pardon the interception would be a good one if we were going to mm. do just like a ton of Jameis, Jameis Winston stuff. Uh, but then, you know, I feel like that's been played out a little. Uh, and f- first and 40, I threw out there. I've always, I've always liked the, the idea of a first and a ridiculous yardage amount, but it was always dual threat. Dual threat was the right one. Cause you'd be talking college. You're going to be talking about uh pro. We're going to be taping it on Tuesday nights. Explain why we're doing that. We're going to get you ready. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and after just week one, when people play, 
the Citadel and whatnot, and you know, Eastern everywhere. I'll give you my playoff rankings <laughs> right. way too early. <laughs> uh, and then, and then once the rankings actually came out, because I act, I believe this is like a real resume builder here, Bill. I don't think you even do this. And we've already agreed on the money, so now I can't ask for more. But I think I'm the only person to consistently, or it's Reese Davis and I. So maybe yeah. that's maybe I misspoke. But Reese Davis and I are the only people to speak to the playoff committee commissioner or you know the the head, the leader of the playoff committee every week for the entire inception of the college football playoff. Because I would always have on um, both guys, both guys that did it. I've had on every week in the history of every ranking for the playoffs. So I'm a perfect guy to then react to them yeah. and tell you why they're doing what they're doing. Because everybody gets mad and goes, they're not consistent. They're not consistent. I go, what they don't want to do is, is be, they don't want to say anything defining so that you can hold it against them later on. They're actually really smart with it. So that's why we'll be doing it that time of the week. So after the NFL, and then once the college football rankings get rolling. So it's going to be college and pro. It'll start with the rankings, then it'll go to wherever you want. You'll have you have some some friends on. We're going to try to produce it so that it moves a few different times over the course of an hour or however long it is, and it'll just be you, you your but your football buddy Ryan Rasilla doing some doing his thing. Yeah, I need some tackle sound effects, and then other than that, just a lot of you know. As soon as I change the topic, so that yeah. people know. Oh, like a and, like a uh, whistle. <laughs> <laughs> like the referee yeah. whistle? Yeah. yeah okay. Right. All right. So that right. so and then, so this is going to be twenty two weeks and we're gonna start it next week. And you can subscribe now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. So that's one thing. The other part of this, which I think people are gonna be a little surprised by. So I have cousin Sal on my football podcast every Monday throughout the NFL season. We do guest the lines. He's the first recurring guest I ever had. And it's usually a 22, 23 week run. And then it ends the Monday after the Super Bowl. And then after that, it moves to the NBA. You are going to step in on those Mondays. And from the Monday after Super Bowl week, all the way through mid July, I, I, we'll know when it's over, when the, when the shitty batch of NBA free agent signings, when we're in that mode and like Michael Beasley for one year, 1.4 million, that's when we'll stop. Yeah, right. Chucky Atkins on a nine hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, that's when we're done. Over. But so for twenty two weeks or so, every Monday, you and me, NBA, and that's it. We're just going hardcore. You're coming in. We're gonna start arguments. We're gonna do our thing. You've heard us do this. Uh, you and I talk basketball. I've done it a bunch of times over the last year. We're gonna make it a regular thing. So that's the other piece of that. I'm really excited about that. I, I'm excited to know every Monday I'm gonna have somebody to talk to. I can't, I can't wait. Like I had all these weekend trips planned and now I realize that I have to sit around and watch more basketball because I don't want to fall behind. But I do feel like it's a little bit like the intro to the real world where it's going to be like what happens after week four when Bill and Ryan stop being friends and start being real. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I know what our first argument is going to be where you were just going to disagree on something and then it'll get like weirdly angry, probably at around the 58 <laughs> minute mark. It June. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if you're going to be on the following week. Right, right. And then all of a sudden, the ringer announced Rosillo's G League podcast, <laughs> where, like, I'm not with you on Mondays anymore. And I'm like, Reno is on fire, guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if so, you're not on on a yeah, Monday, yeah. We'll, know, we'll know something bad happened. Either, either we can't find you or you and I had some sort of argument that we hadn't resolved yet. But we are... Uh, can, I, can I ask you a follow-up to that? Yeah. Who, who had more influence on you making this? decision to pair us together because some people had wondered about it and you know people all my friends would always ask me like why don't you just go to the ringer who was the bigger influence my performance your dad or malcolm gladwell oh wow i mean really i like to those are my three crowdsourcings um no we just we always we just always had fun shooting the shit about basketball and i always feel like especially on a podcast it's a it's a little more informal than it is on radio and Every time we've done a podcast, it's always been too long, which is a good sign because it always goes like an hour and a half, two hours when, you know, because we just hadn't seen each other for a while. And we had a lot of stuff to argue about. So I think being able to do it every, uh, every Monday. Also, like that's really when the season starts, you know, we have, there's a lot of foreplay. The season starts super early now, early October or mid-October. You get through Thanksgiving, you get through Christmas. Uh, around January, there start to be some trade rumors, but the season really gets going. I think uh, early February, that's when the college hoops gets going. You really start getting focused on the draft and the lottery and playoff picture and 
um, there's always one big trade. So we'll be ready for all that. And then obviously April, May, June, July is a gold mine. That's there's something every week. Yeah. I mean, July, July, end of June, July has become probably as much fun as any period. Of, I mean, to think that those two weeks might be the best time to talk basketball, is just it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's especially like the finals ended early last year. Remember it was a four gamer and normally yeah. that would be like basketball would be dead. In 2007, basketball was just gone, and then we had to get the Odin Durant thing going because the Spurs swept the Cavs. Um, but now it's just like the finals end. Immediately, we're moving on to the draft, and I, I don't. I, there's probably a lot of reasons for that, but I think one of the best reasons is just the intelligence is so much better. You know, you have all these draft experts, you have the Ringer NBA draft guide, you have all the YouTube clips, you have all the wannabe coaches, and it just feels like we have a real real opinions on these guys now versus, you know, 15 years ago when you and I were both living in Massachusetts, there was, who, who do we look to in 2001 for our draft info? I don't even, was the chat for it even on the internet yet? I think that's just when he got started. Yeah. yeah. He started doing like, he was, I think Chad was like the first guy to like do links. Yeah. Seriously. Like he would, he would start putting these links together. And, uh, I remember like, I used to bug the shit out of him, but that was those three. Yeah. Right. Did I ever tell you when the Celtics had all those first round draft picks? Oh one to trade all of them for Gary. Yeah, oh one. And they had the three picks in the first round. I called the Celtics because I wanted them to trade those three picks for Gary Payton. This is what a psychopath I used to be. I you, wasn't in the business yet. I was still bartending. And I called like the Celtics front office. I was like, Are you guys aware? Because I wanted a rumor to start with Gary Payton. And then like some some pencil pusher got on the phone with me. She's like, well, yes, yes, sir. We are aware of that rumor. We have no comment. I was like, okay, thanks. And I hung up and played Madden. So that would have been That's 10, insane. 10, 11 and 21 for Gary Payton. Yeah. That's it what it was. It. Yeah. That actually. It totally was worth it. I mean, unless you were a Kedrick guy. Well, they whiffed on two of the three picks. There was a whole NBA draft.net world going on. We did, Rafe Bartholomew did a column or, or did a feature about it for Grantland when, a few years ago. I never really knew that world was going on. That was one of those things, unless somebody told you, you wouldn't have known. It was so hard to find things in the internet in the late 90s, early 2000s. But um, but yeah, and then the well, draft- site's amazing. I mean, it was yeah. great because it would go 60 deep. The crazy thing is they haven't updated the software since the <laughs> Yeah. Now you just get a virus when you go, when you go there. You just, your computer shuts down. But so we have the NBA one. Uh, look, I, there's nothing really to sell. It's me and you talk of basketball. It's, it's going to be every Monday. And I think people know what that is at this point. The football podcast will be interesting because usually people with pods, they usually, they usually hyper target them now. And it's like you do a college football podcast, or you do a pro football, or you do a gambling. This one's going to try to combine both. And you're probably one of the only people that I think could do it. I think you have to not only be at a high level of expertise on it, but kind of have the the savvy of which stories to pick because you're trying to cover all the stuff you care about in 70 minutes or whatever. And it's hard. I basically I'm gonna be interested to see how you respond to the challenge. This is this is a tough one. Well, if it's anything like the last, you know, 15 years, I'm not worried about it because I just sit there in front of the TVs with a legal pad and go to work. But yes. you know, I think the college thing is easy for me because I did nine years of traveling. I mean, I've been to all these places. Like I counted it up with, with Dan Pell and Stanford Steve the other day where I said, I think I've been to 40 campuses and then another five or six like neutral site places. So, you know, and I've already had a couple places reach out to be like, will you do a podcast here and do a game? And I'm like, you know, let's, let's start talking money. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have the CEO, we'll have Kyle, CEO Kyle, you know, crunch the numbers on this stuff. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, look, I love college football and I think it's a little like the NBA and that there's, it's such a soap opera that it's fun to talk about. But just like, you know, Van Pelt or Canel and I, every Monday, like I want to treat the podcast a lot like our Monday show during the season and that whatever the headliney thing is, and a lot of times that is the NFL, that's where you start the show and then you just split it up. So, you know. Sometimes it'll be a little NFL heavy, uh, heavier, and then once the rankings start happening and everybody's freaking out about all the bias that isn't actually out there and people just being totally freaked about their program and thinking they're all getting screwed. It'll be weird if people accuse me of SEC bias working for the ringer, though. That'll be a weird one. Yeah, because we, I mean, college football, we have a couple diehards here, but I don't know what people would blame us for being biased for. Obviously, we have the Boston Philly for the pro sports that we take a lot of shit about, but if college... 
College, not really a lot. The other thing we should mention with the football pod, it, it's not like you're going to avoid this stuff, but you know, you're going to talk football. You're going to talk college football and pro football. And it's not going to be a place where you're going to be talking to somebody for 35 minutes about, you know, chapter 93 in the anthem con- controversy. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear your take on who should no, be number I, one. I don't want to do it. Yeah. I almost retired on the air one during the radio show where I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And I think, um, look, I just say, it. I think other people in the industry seek it out because it's easier to pontificate about the anthem for three hours or one hour or whatever. Cause it's easier to do that than sitting there watching 12 hours of football every Sunday. I'd rather watch 12 hours of football and talk about football. Cause I actually think that's what the listener wants. And I think people are really missing the mark with all of this anthem stuff. I think people have lost it thinking that this is what everybody needs. And it's almost like the Tebow thing. There's a point you do the headlines and then you make the mistake of continuing to do it way beyond the fans that want to go listen to this stuff. So you're right. Like I'm sure it'll come up at some point again because the NFL can't seem to avoid it, but I want to, you know, I want this to be about what's going on on Sunday and Monday. And you're going to have uh, a, cu- a couple of recurring people from your whole world. will be, will be popping in yeah. every so often. Well, well you, you can talk about that roster at a later date. I didn't tell you this, but I think nephew Kyle is going to be your producer. Oh, we went with the A team. Yeah, I, I love, I love Kyle. I'm a huge Kyle fan. You guys don't have a lot in common other than um, a love for dive bars and uh, the ability to stay awake for long periods of time. That's enough. That's, That's enough. It. <laughs> and and, and uh, romantic issues, Kyle. <laughs> How's that going? What's the update today? We'll cover the rest of this on, on Ryan's <laughs> you say, Yeah. You, by the way, you have carte blanche to ask Kyle about his uh, romantic life whenever you want. Whenever you want, whenever yeah, you want you to dig in. I hate that. It's Can like, I let him smoke while he produces my podcast? <laughs> Absolutely. We just build a new studio for, yeah. for that. You know. we'll, just, we'll get one of those uh, those air vents that just suck the smoke out of the office. Smoke and the, smoke. The, yeah. old, the old yeah, bartending days. Those things were awesome. It was just like a big sound machine. And the owner would be like, no, no, it's eating all the smoke. Like, I think that's one, <laughs> um, one other thing with our, with our NBA Mondays, which we're going to have to name, we're probably going to have to put a restriction on Celtics talk. Maybe, or maybe that's just a segment where we only allow each other, where we only allow like seven minutes and that's it. You know what we could do? I don't play chess, but that timer thing seems to come in handy. What if as soon as we, like, we have a determined number of minutes that we're allowed to talk. Oh, you hit the button? As soon as you talk (laughs) Celtics, you hit it. And then if you take up like three minutes and then you stop and then I look down and say, okay, we only have 47 minutes left. Speed chat, like what they use in speed chess. I like it. So we'll get one of those chess timers. And when the Celtics start, we'll just hit the thing and we have like four total minutes. No I, worse than, it, than I am. I mean, that's not even, like, I can do it. You you could be sitting there talking about the Suns draft picks and all of a sudden Roddy Rogers comes up. Yeah, so, you know, I, it, like, it is an issue. I'm going to, it's something I'm going to really work on this season because there's only going to be like four <laughs> fun teams to talk about and the Celtics are one of them and it's going to be really hard not to veer into them. We have no idea how good they're going to be, but they're going to be loaded. I'm already worried about February NBA content as if it's some sort of like left hand dribbling exercise. <laughs> like you go, I got to work on this part. And I play. Hey, by the way, I played pickup hoops yesterday too. What? And Beach first game down here with the gang. Yeah, we ran around with a twenty year old outside. Yeah, Outdoors, outside and everything. They had two hoops. Yeah, full court. All right, incredible. don't get don't get hurt. Don't get hurt. You now, now you're you're juggling two gigs. You're still doing a ton of stuff for ESPN. You're doing TV stuff. Lord knows what else. Um, don't get hurt. I still have one more big thing, but I'm not ready yet. Yeah, but it was great because these guys are like, do you want to run? And I looked and I was like, look how small they all are. I was like, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> so so you're like, uh, I'm trying to think of, of like a physical non-stretch forward now, just clearing bodies out, boxing one kid, out. One, one kid got switched onto me, but not defense. Like he, I switched into him. And he was really small and he put his hand up in the post. It was like, and then he turned around. He's like, I'm not. And it was really funny. And I, I laughed to him. I said, that's the most self-deprecating switch I've ever heard. Like a, <laughs> and uh, anyway, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to think, I'd like to think can be in, in college. Oh, interesting. Interesting. You compare yourself to a seven foot athlete. I like it. Uh, I was 70 yesterday. By the way, LeBron hit that point last year when a smaller guy was switched on him, like when Curry would get switched on him in the finals and Curry would do the thing where you put your your forearm elbow up and you 
and you kind of ram it into the guy to keep your position. And LeBron would just turn around with complete disdain. Like, are you kidding me? Do you realize how strong I am? And then just go like basically through him for a layup. I don't, I really feel like LeBron, Wilt, and Carl Malone. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and uh, Shaq. Carl Malone and have fourth. LeBron, Wilt, Shaq are the three most overpowering. They just had to be the three most overpowering NBA players we've ever had. Right? And LeBron's the shortest Carl of all Malone? of them. Carl Malone, fourth. Carl Malone on the fast break Carl was Malone, pretty terrifying. He's he the mailman? He's yeah. the mailman? What are you going to do when it's raining? Stay inside? Oh, who said that? that? Was the Charles Oakley interview. Charles oh, yeah, Oakley yeah. Charles Oakley, that's right. He said that to me. Like, he yeah. said to you, what are you going to do when it's raining? Like, it was it was unbelievable. It was so funny. Oh, my God, that was so good. He have, had, you, have you checked in with him since? Do you have a part two coming up with Charles Oakley on how not to play cards? We, uh... It was it was a dicey summer for Charles, which we're waiting for him to work through it, and then hopefully he could make his return. Maybe he'll be on NBA Mondays with us. One of those. That's the thing. It's not some day, some Monday. It won't just be us. We might have a third party in there. Might drag someone in. Might call somebody in the phone. You never know. We'll uh, we'll keep you on your you know toes. What do you want to do for the, the football pod? Yeah, is I want to have an NBA GM on with an NFL GM. I want those two to nerd out about the other guys. But I need to find an NBA GM that understands the NFL stuff, and then vice versa. And a working NBA GM or somebody who's between jobs as an NBA GM? Well, I can, I can think of plenty between job guys. Yeah, they're but available. I, I still think of working. <laughs> yeah. I think um, I think that'd be great. But then again, you know, I don't know. The, the NBA guy might be boring and be like, wait, you can just cut guys? Be like, yeah. <laughs> that would, if the so NBA... Still w- painting his canner? Yeah, if the NBA worked like the NFL, it would be... Uh, it would be kind of uh, I, I I don't even know what it would be like. Just be yeah, Enos Cantor would be gone. J- Joakim Noah, it would be going badly for like a month. I do wonder though. You know, I have soccer friends who basically are saying the NBA should just do what like soccer does, where guys can switch teams and there's transfer fees. And um, I I'm not a hundred percent against it. It's definitely it it's definitely would uh would be bizarre and hard to get used to. But at the same time, I I don't know if it would be much different than what we have now. We still are going to have the haves and the have nots, no, no matter how it shakes out, you know? Did you see any world where that could happen? I don't know, man. I mean, I think it's, it's, I don't think it's an old school, new school. It's the reality of it where you have to think to yourself like, Okay, if you're investing, like, what's the point of having a great front office if all you can do is bounce whenever you want to bounce, right? Like, right. what's the point of putting all this stuff? Like, I used to think it'd be awesome if you could just read, I've always said this with you, but like, if you could just redraft the entire league, or yeah. if you were the NBA and said you got to keep one guy, it would make it the most exciting event in the sports calendar of any sport. Like, would baseball be saved if you just redrafted everybody? And you're just better at evaluating people. Hold on for a second, because somebody's here to fix my garage door, and I have to tell him. Hello? <laughs> we're keeping this in the podcast. <laughs> What's that? This is staying in. Yeah, we're not taking this out. Somebody's here to fix my <laughs> garage. <laughs> no, my garage door is like a guillotine right now, and there are bolts like, snapping off of it as it closes. It's so dangerous. I do... I do feel like the NBA is moving closer and closer to that soccer model just because we're seeing the shorter contracts and year after year, the at least the threat somebody might leave, right? Everybody's convinced everyone on the Warriors is leaving except Curry now. That's the, you know, we run out of things to talk about the NBA in August. Yeah, the Durant thing, but, the Durant thing's the new thing, right? Yeah. Like the predicting Durant thing move. And yeah. I mean, look, this, like that Warriors thing, I've always thought, like when Van Gundy's like, oh, they're going to win the next seven or eight. You just go, look, they're awesome. I love them. It's incredible. I don't root against them, but this shit's going to be over quicker than people think. Yeah. Because that's just how guys are. Yeah. At some point, I don't know what year it'll be, but Durant will have enough titles and he'll be ready to do the next thing. I personally, if I were the four of them, I would try to stay together as long as possible. I, I think Curry, when I did the pod with him last week, he definitely, uh, you know, the way he was talking about how the new blood that Cousins was going to bring to them, just somebody different, just a new character in the mix was really going to help them. And I thought that was interesting that he saw that because I felt that way about last year's team. It felt stale, didn't have enough kind of wrinkles and new bloods and mystery. And 
if they can keep those four together, but keep mixing up who's around them, I think, I think it can last a few more years, you know? And I, I don't know if we're going to see a bigger threat to them than that Rockets team was last June. Cause that's about as close as you're going to come defensively to stopping them. I don't, I don't see another team doing better defensively than that, you know? No, that was real. I mean, it was real. And I, I just, you know, you and I brought this up before about the Rockets is can they emotionally match where they were knowing how close they were? Like you would hope that would drive you. Like when San Antonio lost to Miami, it literally drove them from game one until the next year's championship. Right. That they pissed away that title. And that is so impressive and also so hard to do. And I don't know if Houston could do the exact same thing. And that I one you had that, with that San Antonio, you had Duncan, Parker, Ginobili, and Popovich, a foundation of years and years and years together that was able to withstand uh, a devastate, the worst loss we've ever seen in the finals, basically. And with that Houston thing, it's a bunch of guys that really haven't been together that long. And I think that's that's what I'm watching out for, you know? Yeah, totally. Because I don't know roster-wise. Like, I just, I don't think they're as good. Um, I don't think that's really saying, I, I'm surprised that people argue that they're fine. Uh, because I thought a reason was so important for them. But, you know, Daryl finds a way to kind of, Make this, I mean, you know, look, I, I know we've done this before, but like the fact that Daryl actually brought a group together to challenge what we are seeing as maybe the great roster in modern history in the NBA. Yeah. Like that's incredible. And, and if I were him, I'd have a hard time still sleeping because, you know, and I'm sure he does. I'm sure he does because he's a super competitive guy, even though his, his delivery is the same. You know, he doesn't ever feel like his emotions are up or down. Um, I'm sure Daryl, like, I sat next to him in Celtics playoff game where the other team was hitting shots and sitting there being like, they're supposed to start missing. Like, they're 7 to 10. This has to even out. <laughs> yeah. And I would be like, oh, I don't know, dude. I'm like, they just keep hitting shots. I was surprised. Oh, I forgot to ask. This is what I actually what I wanted to do. You and I coming together on a Monday basketball podcast. Yeah. Is that, I don't think we can really say the Splash Brothers because I guess you'd be Curry and I'd be Clay. Although, I would kind of feel good in a way that like super talented but sort of overlooked. <laughs> That would, that would actually fit the bill. Or is it a little bit more like, <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be hard and Chris Paul where no one thinks it's going to work. And nah. Then it gets, it's then it works, it's already I, worked. And I get hurt. No, nah, it's already worked. Right. But then I get hurt and you're lazy at strip clubs, like in a later <laughs> tier in your life, which would be weird because I don't think you would do that. Or is it like a little like Chris Childs now in Houston when Scott, Scott Layden just threw it all together with the Knicks? Because I would definitely be Chris Child. No, I, I like your Curry Clay analogy. And I do think you've been overlooked. I've been a fan for a long time. I'm excited we're finally getting to work together in, in official capacity. We'll make a lot of threes. We already know we can play together and we can space the floor as well as anybody. And we can and we can work with third parties. If somebody wants to come in, we'll do it. And if I go to China and if I go to China by myself, I'm gonna get weird too. Yeah, there's no question. Uh and people talk about what a great teammate you are. You just have to get to know him. Um that's that's the clay that's thing, right? True. Yeah, yeah, no, clay's the best. You just got yeah. you got to get to know him. Um, all right, so we're calling it dual threat. You can subscribe now. Please go subscribe, leave a nice review, couple stars, and then we are launching this thing next week. Dual threat with Ryan Rosillo, and we're doing that the rest of the way on the Ringer Podcast Network. And then when football season ends, you're moving over for uh, Mondays on the BS Podcast for the rest of the season through mid July. I'm excited. Thank you for thank you for doing this with us. Well, thank you for uh, making it happen. And I, I still always kind of laugh the first time we ever really talked when I think we were at fours and you were there getting married or the Friday before and your dad was staring at me recite the Veritech Derek Lowe Shawshank line. <laughs> and he just looked at me like, when's this guy going to get, get out of here? Well, I'll And you were like, no, no, cool, dude. You're like, good work on the zone. And I was like, yeah, all right, all right, folks. Yeah, you guys all have a good weekend, all right? It's a big I don't, I don't, I really don't remember this. I don't remember much anymore. I will tell you, my dad was among the most excited for uh, Rosillo Mondays on the, on the NBA pod. Very, very fired up about it. So there you go. You came full circle with my dad. Good stuff. I'm a big, uh, big fan of the dad. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, check it out. Dual threat. Welcome aboard. And we'll talk to you soon, Ryan Rosillo. All right. Thanks, All right thanks, man. All right, before we get to Jason Tatum, let's talk about Starbucks Double Shot. Starts with bold Starbucks coffee blended with milk for a smooth, creamy, delicious flavor enhanced with ginseng, guarana, and B vitamins. Double Shot available in six delicious flavors, mocha, vanilla, hazelnut, white chocolate, coffee, Mexican mocha. It's an energy coffee drink that not only tastes great, but gives you the energy to go from point A to point done. 
You know who's sharper when they has when they have more energy? Me. It's a good thing to have in your fridge. I wish I had one right now. I'm I'm doing this read at five in the afternoon. I wish I had a little more energy. I wish I had a Starbucks double shot. Guess what? Nephew Kyle drank all of them. Starbucks double shot, energy to do the things you actually do. Find it in your local convenience store. And now, without further ado, Jason Tatum. Here he is. All right, taping this on a Tuesday afternoon, LA time, another hot day in LA. Jason Tatum is here. Boston Celtic came within a minute of the of the finals last year. Are you still replaying that or did you move on? Uh, I think I've moved on a little bit looking forward to next season, but uh, I definitely replayed that for a while, you know, after the season, just trying to get it through my head. You know, first year that we were so close, you know, to beating the best player in the world to get into the championship. Uh, but uh, that just makes me more excited for next year. What's your biggest memory from that game other than the three and the dunk on LeBron? And wow. then you kind of stared him down. I don't even know if you did it intentionally. I think my emotions got the best of me. Uh, besides those two, what would yeah. be my best memory? Uh, Crazy crowd. Yeah, just the atmosphere. You know, everything's on the line. Uh, it was our second game seven of that playoffs, but uh, obviously the most important. And uh, I feel like everybody in the world that watches basketball was watching that game. Yeah. It felt like an event. And it was really LeBron. It was just a classic LeBron game. It was, you know, there was there was a time in his career where maybe the crowd could have gotten to him a little bit. And those days are long gone. But it, but still, the Celtics had a chance to win. When you had the dunk and the, th the three in the dunk or whatever the sequence was, it was like five minutes left. I really thought the Celtics were going to win at that point. And then it's just, it was one of those things. The shots just weren't going. The same threes that were going in all year. That yeah, was it. it. They just kind of ran out. And then the same thing happened to Houston uh, the next night. Mm -hmm. It was the same thing. They were allowed in the three the whole year. It just didn't happen. Um, you guys got counted out heading in the playoffs when it got announced that Kyrie was out. And everybody's like, oh, well, they're done. They might win one round. And then you became the nobody believes in us team and you got a little momentum. When did you start to feel like you could actually make the finals? Uh, it was, well, when Kyrie got announced that he wasn't going to, it was March, end of March. I remember we were in Portland on our second West Coast road trip and uh, we played Portland without him, Phoenix, Sacramento, and, uh, was the West Coast swing? That maybe Denver. It's one of those Utah. Utah. Yeah. So we play. We play Utah, Sacramento, Phoenix, and Portland. All like when we once we found out he wasn't going to be with us, and I mean we figured we probably could beat Sacramento and Phoenix, but we beat we beat Utah, and we beat Portland. And you know from then on, you know that's when I really knew like you know Utah and Portland were two really good teams. And, yeah. Uh, we had we still had 20 games left to figure you know our new team out um, you know without him to find a way and figure out how we were going to be during the playoffs and um, you know our team our team was unique in the sense that uh, you know it was just going to take a collective effort every night you know I, I don't think the opposing team really knew who was going to be you know the leading scorer you know that night and we just played really well as a team and we were young. We had a lot to prove because obviously uh, we we heard all the talk about, you know, people didn't think that we were going to make it. Uh, we were probably losing the first round. And, you know, we had a lot of young guys, like including myself, that, you know, wanted to prove to to the world that we belonged here. And you're the two Marcuses who think they who think they could beat anyone on any day, no matter what the odds are. No, I would I would take those two <laughs> against anybody in the league. Were you sure. worried Marcus Smart was going to leave? Uh, I mean, you Anything's possible, obviously, in the NBA. But uh, I knew, you know, we wanted him and he wants to be a Celtic. And, you know, it's where, he's, it's where he belongs. I can't see Smart in any other uniform right now. Did you text him? Say, don't go? Send him, like, an Amazon gift card? Uh, no, I, I didn't <laughs> want to pressure him. Uh, but he knew that I wanted him to stay and everybody on the team, we need him. What did you learn from going against LeBron in that last round? I learned a lot. Because uh, you kind of went to grad school. <laughs> you you were in Duke for one year and then you went to LeBron school. True. Uh, I learned that he was definitely the best player in the world. Uh, no question about that. And um, just how dominant dominant he is, and like 
he, it's it's tough because it's you know people will go on the TV and, and be like the Celtics can't let them do this or they got to take this away. It's like we're not letting them do anything. <laughs> yeah, like we trying, but uh, I mean he's just a he's a great player. Had you ever defended anyone even remotely as strong as him? As strong? Yeah. No, not that can move. At that position? No, not that can move like he can. No. Because the first, I remember you played him a bunch of times that year, and a couple of times he posted you up, and you do the forearm to the back thing, and he like really takes that personally when people do. They just kind of goes through people, which started about three years ago. There's really no way to defend him on the low post. No, I mean, you just got to. I mean, it's basketball is a team sport, so it's a lot of guys that are really, really, really tough to guard. Yeah, you know, in the NBA, just by yourself. So, uh, you know, you got to trust in your your help defense, really. Well, that one's tough because he can pass too. Yeah. So it's like, and, and he's he's like got that computer brain, and he's oh, you're going to do this. Well, then I'm going to send the ball this way, and he knows it's almost like he's knows ahead of time what everybody's going to do. And that you had consecutive rounds, you had Giannis, you had Ben Simmons. And then you had LeBron, who are three of kind of the unicorns in the league right now. The Giannis thing, you guys, I'm not going to say you figured out, but you at least, you took away his coast-to-coast stuff and you took away the paint and you made him beat you outside. What happens if he gets a jump shot? Uh, I don't know if we figured it out. Um, I'm pretty sure he still it worked. averaged. I mean, he, he, he still averaged 20. Yeah, he had like twenty six. Yeah, twenty six a game. game. So, uh, I guess you kept him mildly in check for considering how much he had the ball. Yeah, I mean, it was just a collective effort, like you said. We just had to get back on defense because, you know, we know when he gets it, he's coming down full head of steam. Yeah, you know, trying to get to the basket, then trying to create. So we just have to load up and wall up. And uh, I mean, the thing that really not surprised me, but I noticed he he knocked down. Probably not 85, 90% of his free throws. And, uh, yeah. It's a good sign was, for his jump shot. Yeah. The, the move that he has where he does that, you kind of have a similar move, but you, you kind of go to your left with it and you do that spin shot. Mm. Um, he has that, it just, he covers 20 feet in two steps and you don't realize that's happening until he already did it. It seems like a travel, but he's just kind of an alien. Um, then Ben Simmons was the other one where, you were uh, basically the same game plan. Don't let him get to the rim. Keep him kind of outside the paint. And it seemed like that worked too, but you need the big guys. And I don't know. It's just, I was amazed you got to the finals with basically playing seven guys, you know, 20 games. Plus you got, you hit the Ricky wall. When, when did you hit the Ricky wall first? In like December, January? January. You could feel it. Yeah, I could tell. So what did you, what did you feel? Like your legs were gone? What was going on? It was physically, mentally, like it. It we'd play on a on a Tuesday. And I'd have like twenty two points, and then Thursday I'd have two points, dribbling <laughs> the ball off my leg, right. for getting the plays, and I I just couldn't understand. Like, like some days I would have it, and other days it was just like I don't know how to play basketball anymore. Yeah, but then after the All Star break, uh, I think that's good, especially for first year players, just to get a break from it for a little bit. And you did the whole All Star break. They put you through the uh, through the whole machine, rookie sophomore game, pictures with a million people, interviews. Was that fun or was that like grueling? Uh, a little bit of both, but you know, I looked at it as I'd rather be here than not be here. Yeah. So uh, he would have been frustrated if you didn't make it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, next year maybe you make the actual game. That's the plan. Could have marked that down on the on the old calendar. It's in Charlotte. Yeah, go back. What, what kind of feedback were you getting from the guys you were playing against? Because I've noticed the all stars and the veterans, they definitely will embrace the ones that they think are going to be good. And you could see that with LeBron and you. And even Kobe did that detail thing about you. And you could you felt like you were getting momentum as it went along. But what was happening during the season? What were you picking up from people? Uh that's one thing that I was I want to say nervous about because, you know, there's a lot of stories. You know, as a rookie coming in that, you know, veterans aren't as acceptive to young guys. And, you know, some like I heard a lot of stories where, you know, some guys bets were like mean to him or tried to get him in trouble or wouldn't help him out because I mean, it is a business at, at the end of the day. 
and they were looking at it as he's going to take my spot. Competition. He's yeah. taking the money that I want. And so that's what that's one thing that uh I, I want to say I was nervous about. But then it was totally opposite, you know, especially the guys on my team, like everybody, all the old guys from Kyrie Baines, Smart, Horford, Morris, like they just tried to help me out as, as much as possible and as any way. And it was a total shock because I heard so many stories of how the older guys don't like the younger guys. Right. But it was even like from guys on the other team after after games would come up, you know, and, you know, tell me, you know, things I could work on and see what they like in my game. And uh, I mean, that was that was big because, you know, for young guys, obviously we're in the NBA, but we still kind of look up to a lot of guys yeah. that are older than us. Your guy was LeBron, right? LeBron. As a kid? No, my favorite player was Kobe. And... Uh, oh, so when he did the detail on you, that was a big deal. Yeah, I watched it like 70 times. <laughs> that was my favorite player ever. But Le- <laughs> LeBron was one of them. Carmelo, Paul George, uh, KD. Guys that just, you know, play the wing position. Who did you borrow from when you were learning how to become a basketball player? Or were you just like your own style? Uh, I took a little bit of, uh, from everybody, especially like I studied a lot of Paul George and Mello when I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, those are two guys that, you know, I always would watch film on. And and Kobe, Kobe's just from the day I started playing. Like, he was the reason I wanted to play basketball. Like, from a kid, like, my earliest basketball memory was of him. Uh, so how old are you, 20? So you start watching basketball. So the right around when he had, like, his 81-point game and stuff like that. Like, you remember that. Even before then, like, when I was, like, four and five like I just always tell my mom I always ask me what I, what I wanted to be when I got older and I, I was just like I want to be Kobe yeah She'd like you want to be in the NBA it's like no like I want to be Kobe like he was just my favorite player I had his posters all his jerseys he was that was my guy well I don't like that he's trying to he's become your friend and you're working out with him in the summer you know he's on he's a Laker we don't like the Lakers the Lakers were my favorite. I used to hate Boston. Yeah, well, we we need to fix that. No, I love Boston now. You're, now you're you're in Boston for the next twenty years. You gotta. <laughs> I, you might have to dump Kobe. You might have to get rid of him. <laughs> we hate the Lakers, and now they have LeBron. This could this could be the the rivalry could be back for. I mean, man, sixties, eighties, last decade. Now now it could be on again. Uh, what did Co- what is kind of stuff does Kobe tell you? Does he do that Mamba mentality and all that, like the uh, the mind game warrior, all that stuff? Or does he actually work with footwork? What is he doing with you? Uh, you know, I I got a chance to, you know, just sit down and talk to him first. You know, I got to meet with him. And we talked about a lot of things, uh, basketball related, non-basketball related. Uh, you know, just talked about, I tried to get into his mind and see how he went about things. Uh, just trying to get better each year, you know, how what he wanted to improve on year after year so he didn't backtrack or be complacent, you know, just to, you know, his, you know, will to just be the best and, and just striving to get better every year. And that's one thing I found interesting. And, uh, you know, when we were working out, you know, he was, he said uh, his his thing was just trying to break the game down and make it as simple as possible. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he said the year he averaged 35, you know, all he worked on in the summertime was, you know, pivot foot you know trying to play off both pivots and he said I that's all I did for the entire summer and uh you know obviously I expanded off a move from each pivot and a counter move to that but he was like the, the entire summer that's all I worked on you know when he averaged 35. Yeah well it seems like Bird, Ma- Magic, Michael, Kobe all those dudes would go into the summer and they try to add one thing that didn't have the year before and you know, LeBron didn't really do that for a while. And then I think when he went to Miami, he finally started adding stuff. And now, like, he even just in the last two years, he has that crazy fall away now that I don't think he had two years ago. Now I wonder if he's going to play the four more this year. What, what does he add with that? But um, I always respected that. But so what So what are you going to add for next year? What's, uh, that, what's in the hopper? Hmm. You can't tell us? No, it's going to be a secret? No. I'm going to find out in the preseason. <laughs> uh, just working on getting stronger. Um, and, you know, shooting threes off the dribble. Uh, I got a lot of open shots last year. Yeah. I don't really expect that 
to happen as much this season. So yeah. being able to create my own shot from the three off the dribble this year is something that, you know, I want to get better at. So watching you as the playoffs went along, it was weird. You had like three se- and you had like four seasons. You had a great first seven weeks. You hit the rookie wall. Then you came back in the regular season and you looked like you did the first six weeks. And then in the playoffs, I, I thought you actually went up a level. But the, the biggest thing that clicked, it seemed like, was the defense. And you just kind of, the switching thing, I, like how complicated is that to figure out from scratch, especially coming from college? The, it's very complicated because uh, there's a, it's a whole entire new system. Yeah. New coaches, new terminology. Uh, had you ever played like that before where you were instead of covering somebody you just switch 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 almost every time y- yes but you know each I guess each team has their own different rules when to switch how to switch yeah uh, you know when not to do it so it was just tough learning you know our system but uh, that's what you know preseason is for and that's where I credit the older guys to helping me out a lot at, and you know Cause you got to learn on the fly. You know, it's funny. Like with that, not only do you idolize Kobe, but he talked to you because I thought he really lucked out with the situation he got drafted into. Cause a lot of times, especially like a top three pick, you send him go, you go to a crap team and you go to a team that either has a new coach or a coach who's about to be fired and a GM that either just got there is about to leave and probably an owner that's not great. And they have this five year plan. Um, the new guy gets shoved in. You're expected to do everything right away. You're losing 60 of 82 games and it just sucks. And Kobe went into a situation where he had Shaq and the team was good and they made the playoffs. And within a couple of years, they're in the finals. You were in a situation, they really leaned on you. The Hayward thing, which was awful, gave you even more minutes than you probably would have gotten. But you end up playing 100 games. Um, that's about as good of a fortunate situation I think as you can get in the NBA because think about it you could have gone on a team that was like 15 and 67 and had veterans that were completely threatened by you mm. and some coach that didn't know what to do with you like did you appreciate that as it was going along or you just caught in the season no I definitely was you know very you know grateful and thankful to you know where I got drafted to uh I don't think there was a better situation that I could have gone to just to you know go from Duke to go to Boston, you know, I think, uh, you know, just coming from Duke really helped me out a lot. Uh, yeah. Because we were always, you know, the, the main focus and always on TV TV and in the spotlight in college. And, you know, it was no different to where I got, you know, when I got to Boston. Um, you know, just a great organization. I was talking to guys on our team that have played for other teams and saying that, like, Boston is really different. You know, yeah. the, the support. Um, just the way they run things, you know, every organization from what we hear, you know, it's not, the, it's not great. It's not the same. So, um, you know, they say Boston is, is from, you know, the best or one of the best organizations. And, uh, you know, there wasn't a better situation for me to go to. You took it personally, you didn't go one. To go number one in the draft? Yeah. You can admit it now. No, of course. Uh, I mean, I grew up, I always wanted to be the number one pick. Yeah. Uh. I mean, I wasn't. I You're a competitive guy, though. You're like, really? I'm not going to be number one? Okay. I'll file that one away. But it wasn't like I, I knew that on draft night. It was kind of like, I feel like the media had a lot to do with it, you know, saying that, you know, Markel and Lonzo were going one and two. So I kind of just not accepted it, but really, you know, I kind of understood, like, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. Because, you know, that was just the talk. Markel and Lonzo wanted two. So I just uh, figured I was going third, maybe fourth. I knew I was going three or four. I well, you would have gone one if all the Lakers had to do was bluff and pretend they were taking you second and the Celtics wouldn't have been able to do the trade. Yeah, that, joke, was, that was the thing that really helped the Celtics. I joke with Danny all the time. Uh, it should have just took me number one. Could have kept a few dollars in my <laughs> yeah, you would have made a little more, right? Tell him he owed me some money. <laughs> you should tell Magic Johnson. All you had to do is bluff, and I would have gone first. You would have made me an extra, yeah. I forgot about that, the salary cap thing. Did you get to know Markel at all or no? Yeah, you know, me and Markel, we we really close. Um, we work out with the same trainer now. So, oh, yeah, yeah. So I see him at the Drew, gym. Drew, right? Yeah, yeah, Drew. So I see Markel all the time. How's we, he looking? 
he's looking good. He's getting better. Uh, and I'm excited for him because uh, obviously he wants to play and uh, he wants to get out there and show people what he can do. And uh, I'm excited. I'm buying Markel stock right now. I think he's t- he's too fast and he's too athletic. There's there's no way he shouldn't be a good NBA player at some point. You see, he just has too much skill. I don't know what happened to him last year, but it seems like he got through it. But um, I don't know. I'm always going to bet on athletic ability. I love Lonzo, too. I think he's going to be really good. He got hurt midway through last year. But um, I think that draft has a chance to go down as one of the all-timers, especially because Mitchell was later. I still think uh, I think Fox is still going to be really good. I like marketing. I think that draft's going to be a special one. Did you know all those guys before the draft just from – AU circuits and stuff? Yeah, I knew everybody that was in my high school class. I knew all of those guys. Because you were always like a top, you were always in the top of those lists and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we've always played against each other in AU camps and USA basketball, uh, college. You know, I went to college with Frank Jackson, Harry, yeah. Luke Kennard. So I, I, I knew basically everybody. Uh, from so class. from like eighth grade on, you started to know these guys? Yeah, pretty much. Who did you think like in eighth, ninth grade was going to be the best one out of like who did anybody really stand out at age 14? Harry Giles. He was, he was by far the best player in our grade. And I'm pretty sure everybody, you can ask anybody that was in our class, like even in high school, like Harry, Harry was the only player that I would, I would have said in high school, like, yeah, he might be better than me. Really? I saw him in summer league. He looked good. Our senior year, he didn't play one game, and he still was ranked number one. So it shows you that he was he he was the man in high school. Wow! And I'm pretty. I'm I'm excited. I hope he you know he's going to come back, and uh, obviously he has a lot to prove and you know show everybody you know what he can do because he's basically taking two years off. But uh, in high school, he was by he was the best player. I saw one of those. Those teen, the team USA, like under 18 or under 19 or wh- whatever one of those. And he was in when he was healthy. And it was like, oh my God, that guy looks like KG. Like he literally was the same type of, it was like KG had cloned himself as a 17 year old. I used to call him Chris Weber. That's why, that's who I thought he used to play like. Oh, that's interesting. Could he pass like him back then? He could, he could do everything at 6'11. I'll tell he Danny was- to trade for him. I mean, Danny can sneak, can sneak in. Sacramento is easy to trade with. You just call them. You just, <laughs> you just, 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 take, just offer them things. They eventually they say yes. Do you, Harry Giles went to Duke though, right? He only played like seven games, or he just couldn't get healthy. Uh, yeah, he went to Duke. Uh, Harry, he's like he's like my best friend. Yeah. We were during USA basketball. We were roommates, and uh, we were roommates in college. Uh, I think I don't know how many he played in college. Mm. Maybe. I was I at summer league. I was impressed because he was moving around well, but you could just tell. You could you've watched enough basketball, you know, within like five minutes, you could tell he had a feel for the game. And when they picked him, I was like, "That's risky." Like that guy's had two knee surgeries already. But you know, now with modern science and stuff, um, what made you go to Duke? Uh, Coach, Coach K? K. Coach K probably. So he sucked you in, huh? <laughs> That's why we have JJ Redick on the on. He's one of our podcasts. Cody he talks about the magic of Coach K. It just sucks you in. Yeah, because uh, I only took one official visit in college. It was my junior year. Uh, I wanted to commit on spot. Yeah, but uh, I waited a little bit. But you know, Coach K. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's anybody like him. Yeah. So just, did he pull the thing where he had Kobe on his cell phone and called him for you? No, nah, he didn't do anything. Come like on, that. admit it. He didn't do that. Nope. Nothing. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Texted him. Nope. I never know if he de- if those stories are true about his recruiting stuff, where he has the guys on the speed dial. Oh, you're a big <laughs> Carmelo fan. I'm gonna get him on the phone right now, Carmelo. It's Coach K. No, he didn't. He didn't <laughs> do that. How did you How did you get bounced in the tournament that year? I forget. With Duke. We lost to South Carolina in the second round. Ah. Uh, was that a worse loss than the game seven Cavs? Yeah. Because you didn't see it coming. I mean, we no, we knew they were good, but the NCAA threw us in a trick bag. It was We played South Carolina in the second round in 
South Carolina. So it was a it was a home game for them. Oh, you think they're sticking it to Coach K? I don't know. There's a lot of Duke haters in the world. <laughs> they don't want to see us win. Let's take a break to talk about our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, America's premier home purchase lender. Hey, when you're buying a home, it could be one of the most important purchases you'll ever make, but today's fluctuating interest rates can leave you with higher payments, turning a great experience into an anxious one. That's why Quicken Loans created their exclusive power buying process. Here's how it works. They check your income, assets, and credit, give you a verified approval, which means you have the strength of a cash buyer once verified, You qualify for their exclusive rate shield approval and they'll lock your interest rate for up to 90 days. If rates go up, your rate stays the same. If rates go down, you get to keep the lower rate. Either way you win. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash Bill Simmons. Rate shield approval only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records, equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org. Number 30, 30. You grew up in St. Louis, the St. Louis hoop scene. So Larry Hughes, your uncle, Jojo White. Mm. Who else? Darius Miles. East St. Louis, right? Close. Really is basically St. Louis. uh, David Lee. David Lee. Bradley Beal. Oh, Bradley Beal's a good one. Anthony Bonner. He's an old, old guy. Jahadi White. Darius Miles is a good example of got drafted by the wrong team. Yeah. I think if he had gone to a more stable team that kind of knew what he was and pushed him that direction, instead he went to the Clippers and it was like a free for all and he was playing four positions and never really figured out what it was. He still made money. He signed one big contract, but yeah, he did. So Hughes, um, I remember when he came into the draft, that was the Paul Pierce Nowitzki. Michael Ola with candy, all that stuff. He went two spots ahead of Pierce. But I remember he he was one of the first one and done guys. He came in because his, his I think his brother was sick. He needed to yeah. he needed to uh make money basically right away. And he kind of knew he wasn't ready. And I remember thinking, like, oh man, I wish he could have stayed. Now everybody's one and done. But what'd you learn from Larry Hughes? He must have been giving you advice from the moment he knew you could make it, right? Yeah. Uh he's he's a lot older though. The yeah. the guy I was really close to was Brad, because me and Brad only five years, six years apart. Uh, yeah. When he was in twelfth grade, you know, we went to the same school, so my middle school was connected to his high school. Really? So at, he used to take me home every day after school because I would uh, we would shoot around after after he would practice, and even after he got drafted, he would come home in the summertime, and uh, he would pick me up every day in the summer take me to the gym, we work out, we go play the game, we go back and work out again, and uh, he dropped me back off at home. Sometimes I'll stay over his his house. But, uh, you know, Brad's like my big brother. Uh, so 12th grade Bradley Beal would pick up 6th grade Jason Tatum? 7th grade. 7th grade. He would take me home from school because we live, he lived like around the corner for me, maybe two yeah. minutes. So he would drop me off at home and then he would go home. That's amazing. And now both of you guys, did he make, he made the all-star team last year, didn't he? Yeah, this year. Yeah, last year. So what, so what do you think he saw in seventh grade Jason Tatum other than a kid that he liked? Did he think you had like a chance at that point? Uh, Yeah. I mean, I was pretty, I was always pretty tall. And, uh, you know, it was, it's funny because his mom was my mom's high school volleyball coach. Yeah. So we've always had a, you know, connection. We live in the same neighborhood. And uh, especially after he got drafted when I was in high school, you know, you could kind of see that I really, really had a chance to make it. Yeah. And uh, he just wanted, you know, to, you know, be that person to, to help me out and, you know, be a great role model. You did. There's a big Boston Globe piece about you last spring about growing up in St. Louis and what your life was like and all that. And, you know, I think a lot of guys who have come into the league have had rough childhoods, things like that. How, now that the life you have now and you're on these charter planes and you have money to pay for stuff, like how long ago does that seem like? Not not long not long enough. Uh, I've only been in the league one year, still 20, so uh, it was very recently. Was it's your been, neighborhood dangerous? When I was younger... 
Uh, so like elementary school and middle school it was. But once I got to high school, it, it got a lot better. Yeah. Uh, but St. Louis isn't the best place to live at yeah. as a city. But uh, I love St. Louis to death. If yeah, St. Louis had a team, I would go play for St. Louis. You did that's that would, that's all it would take. Well, yeah. maybe that's a that's a good reason to have an expansion team there. <laughs> Come back. I Wait, I, now I'm going to root against this. This is a bad <laughs> idea. I don't like this. Well, they had the Hawks. They won a title there in 1958. They beat the Celtics. Yeah, I remember that. Well, yeah. I don't remember, but yeah, I know Bob, about it. Bob Pettit, and then they moved to Atlanta, which I think they probably would have been better off staying in. Uh, in St. Louis, the school, the college never really took off as a basketball school. They had a couple of moments, but. St. Louis University? Yeah, they never, they had a couple of times where it was like, oh, this is interesting this year, but they never like had a run or anything. Yeah, that was my second choice for college. Really? Mm -hmm. Like. You think that would have been a good idea to stay home? I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm obviously glad I went to Duke, but, uh, you know, I, I, one of the biggest reasons was, you know, I love St. Louis a lot. I thought I was going to get homesick, so I did. I wasn't sure if I wanted to leave St. Louis or if, you know it would work out. And I just felt really comfortable, yeah, you know, being home. So, I, when you go back during the summers, what do you do? Are you doing the camps? What's going on to St. Louis? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had two basketball camps back in St. Louis. Uh, yeah, I noticed there were some videos. I was monitoring your summer. I was making sure you weren't going to the ESPYs and, you know, letting the fame get to your head or anything. But it seemed like it was all basketball. Yeah. Basketball and business. Business? What kind of business? Uh, I went to China on a on a business trip with Nike Yeah, two weeks ago. Uh, I've been traveling city to city, basically doing photo shoots, appearances, commercials, things like that. One thing I don't understand about your generation, I've talked about this on a podcast, you guys all come into the league totally polished now. And and my theory is that the generate I always think the guys emulate the generations before them. So the generation right before you is the LeBron, Kobe, and all those guys handle the media great. They have all these interests off the court. They're trying to be businessmen. Like, Do you sense that even when you're in high school that these guys have all these things going on? You want to be like that? Yeah, I think now, you know, when I was in high school, uh, you know, there's all these specials and, you know, you know, now with videos and TV, uh, you know, guys, you know, have a chance to, you know, speak, you know, on what they enjoy to do. And, you know, the good thing about that is, you know, we look up to them and, yeah. um, you know, when they talk about these off, off the court things that, you know, they want to do and expand and life beyond basketball, you know, Every time we go to a camp in high school or anything, you know, we always have seminars and talking about, you know, when the ball stops bouncing, you know, what are you going to do? With it? Yeah. Uh, you know, you hear all these stories about, you know, guys that had a lot of money and lost all their money. Yeah. And, um, you know, when they're willing to come back to the, these all-star camps and, you know, tell their story and, you know, just tell us what not to do. Um, so I think we have more of an advantage, you know, than maybe guys before us did coming into the league. And uh, that really, really helps us out a lot. Yeah, your class in particular is all of the people in that class seem like they're like 28 years old already. Like you, you were doing those post game interviews with Abby Chin, and I was like, "What the hell? This dude's 19. He's he's answering like he's a 10 year pro." Um, I I don't understand it. I'm my generation of basketball. The rookies came in and they seem like rookies. You know, <laughs> Barkley was. People like Bar occasionally have like Barkley would come in and he's like, wow, that guy's a character. He's going to be something. But for the most part, people seem kind of overwhelmed by it. Um, going into year two, are you monitoring the other contenders? And like, were you following the July, the signings, Boogie Cousins to the Warriors, Kawhi to Toronto? Do you care about that stuff or you just wait till the season starts? Uh, I mean, I care. I mean, it's in my profession. So, because Kawhi's in your conference now, yeah, you haven't really gone against him. I never played against him. Yeah, was, it's uh, it's not it's not fun if he's on his game. He he's he's a monster. No, I'm a, very much aware. Yeah, from what I've seen. So we got him. We have Philly didn't really do anything. They lost a couple of bench guys. They added Wilson Chandler. 
Golden State had a boogie. The Lakers obviously are completely different. Houston's a little bit worse. And worse? you got yeah, a little bit worse. They lost Ariza. I thought he was big for them. They got Melo. So you think Melo makes up for Ariza? Now is this because you're a fan of Melo, or are you actually you see the basketball fit for him? I think he'll fit. I think he'll fit well in. Well, I'm definitely a fan of Melo, and obviously he's not the defender that Trevor Ariza is, but he's a better scorer. And the Carmelo Anthony defense. See, we're not getting a lot of these this summer. Yeah, a lot uh, of people think that's not going to work out, including a myself. People, a lot of people hate on Melo. I don't. I don't see why. I he's think averaged it, twenty points every year in his career besides last year. Not too many people have done that. I was one of the last. I have a long Carmelo column in my archives. I was one of his last. I thought he could be the best player in a title team, guys. I mean, he's past his prime now, but I still feel like there was a path for him. Not different than what happened with Nowitzki in Dallas, where he was the lead scorer and they had the right team around him, and you could go to him at the end of the games, he get buckets. And Carmelo never totally had that team, but on the other hand, he kept signing with the Knicks, you know, and that was the last few years of his prime. I don't know. You're in a situation where, um, I mean, there's so much there's so much talent this year. I'm going to be interested to see how the minutes shake out. Have you thought about that? I don't know if you realize this, but Gordon Hayward's really good and needs to play. And then you got you, and you got Jalen Brown, you got Marcus Morris, Marcus Smart, Kyrie. There's a lot of players in this team. Al Horford. How are the minutes going to work? I don't know. Uh, that's Brad. That's Brad's job. You know, our job is just to go out there and be the best versions of ourselves, and uh, you know, understanding our role and. You know what each one of us needs to do to make sure that we're the best team that we can be. That was a media training answer. That was really well done. That's <laughs> why you got to do that in the preseason too. <laughs> Just got to go out there and do our jobs. <laughs> you have to, the biggest thing for you is if you can play more of the four and guard other fours, that opens up more minutes, I think. Right, which mean which goes back to the getting stronger thing. Right, exactly. So, That's, how do you get stronger? What are you up to? Eating as much as possible and lifting as often as I can. I know I'm not going to throw on twenty pounds in one summer. Uh, you got to do it over like the course of like three years, right? Yeah, I don't want to just get super big. You know, I want it the the strength and the weight to you know be comparable to you know how I play. Let's take a break. Talk about my bookie. People always ask me for advice. Usually it's what team to bet on this week. The truth is, I don't know who's going to win. But if you think you know, you got to check out my bookie. I always tell people to bet with my bookie. Trust me, they're your best bet this season. They've been in business for years. Great reviews online. Their mobile site, easy to use, not to mention in-game live betting and the most rewarding player perks in the business. Plus for you fantasy guys out there, you can even bet the over-under on how many fantasy points a score a player will score in each game. So lay down some cash, win big today. You win, they pay. Join now. My bookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar. Use the promo code Bill Simmons to activate the offer. Visit my bookie online today. That is my bookie, M Y B O O K I E. Don't forget to use the promo code Bill Simmons when creating your account to claim the bonus. You play, you win, you get paid. Back to Jason Tatum. Where did that move come from when you go at the guy? And instead of going right, you go left and you do the Dr. J swoop thing. When did you, where did that come from? Did you steal it from somebody? And when could you first do it? Uh, I mean, you try things out in a game, improvise. Uh, I think basketball is a lot about, you know, reactions. And Because I think that's an original move. I don't know if Dr. J had that one exactly, but I, I, other than that, I haven't seen that one before. Because it always seems like you're going to crash into the cameraman. <laughs> I'm always, it's one of those Isaiah Thomas was like that too and he would have the, the his sprawling lefty move and it would always end up with him going into the camera and I was like maybe pull that one back 10% but the uh, the spin nobody ever said everybody always thinks you're going right on that one but then you could also go right as well so Keep what's the third variation of that dunk it just dunk it right on him yeah did you know you were going to dunk on LeBron when you dunked on him? Or was that and in the moment, oh, this is how I'm taking it? I knew when Brad drew up the play, 
I told myself I was going to dunk the ball. Uh, I was trying to, I think we were taking too many jump shots at the time. And I remember I told myself, just go to the rim, go try to dunk it. I didn't, I obviously didn't know he was going to be down there. Yeah. But I remember when I turned the corner, I saw him and I was like, uh oh. <laughs> and I, I told my, I was just like, I just knew I had to, I just tried to dunk it as quick as possible because obviously he's a great shot blocker. So, uh, I just tried to, I don't, it just happened so fast. Like, I don't even remember jumping. I just remember, like, I guess jumping and then I blinked and then I dunked on him. Then the crowd went crazy. And I chest bumped him. He gave you the props right afterwards, though. Yeah, he did. He did the old, the lean in, guard hiding from the camera. It was like whispered, like, yeah, that was good. That was, that's, that's his official, um, blessing when he does that I like that I the thing with LeBron when he's out of the league I wonder who becomes the guy like right now he's the most important guy to do that and then when he leaves who's the next guy you know he's kind of the father figure now and then eventually it'll be you know KD or I, I don't know who it'll be and then then the torch will keep passing um one other thing about that game seven that we should mention the Celtic friends wanted you to shoot more and felt like every once in a while you'd remember you you could get to the rim whenever you wanted and then other times you wouldn't and it was a total rookie thing like you'll get it but could you sense even were your teammates because they were I went to a couple of those games they were yelling at you to shoot so how do you get over that hump of having that confidence what's the next step for you uh walk me through it yeah I mean I think it was just a rookie thing um like you don't believe even though you know you can do it, you don't totally believe it yet or so much going on, you're processing everything. What is it? I think it's more of like, I don't know. I think at first I was just trying not to step on anybody's toes. Yeah. Trying to fit in. Uh, not that I am trying to step on anybody's toes, but uh, I think you just got to be yourself. Um, I think once you put in the work and, you show that, you know, you deserve to take, you know, of you've earned some of these shots. Yeah. Then, uh, you know, I think it's, I don't think anybody has to say anything. It's just known, like, like Kyrie, like, he can shoot any shot he wants to. Like, he's earned that right. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it takes time. Yeah, I felt the best thing about you last season was you could fit into anything, right? And that to have that switch of oh shit we need a basket I'm, I got this this time that takes a couple years Kyrie is who he was on the pod last month and we were talking about you know he'll 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 get by somebody once in the first quarter just to show the guy he can do it and then he doesn't do it again for two quarters because he already knows he can do it whereas other people would be like oh I might get sixty tonight and they'll just keep going by the guy he just does it the one time to kind of plant the seed and then he knows he can do it for uh for later he he was i've never watched anybody like him day in day out before where like there were there must have been 20 games where i thought he was gonna get 50 points and then he wouldn't shoot for an entire quarter <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to guard him in practice uh are there any tricks we didn't really practice you never got switched on him we didn't really scrimmage that much in practice yeah uh it was more of just recovery. You know, everybody would work out individually. And, you know, because we had a lot of guys that, guys that were banged up this year. So mm. we didn't want to risk anything in practice. So we would do five on no, you know, walkthroughs. So uh, when did you, when did you realize that Stevens was a coaching freak and that he could drop magical inbound plays out of thin air and do all these crazy things that he does during games? Was that right away or is that like halfway through the season? Like, oh my God, this is unique. Right away. But my favorite play is when we played um, Philly, game three. Oh, the Al Horford play? Yeah. But even the play before that when I think it might have been before overtime. Or it might have been in overtime. Where I was taking it out by our bench and we were doing some cuts and I threw it over the top to JB. And he caught it over Ilya Sobin and laid it in. But 
like he just Brad the Al Horford play. He just knew like I remember I was at the block and he knew Philly was switching everything. So when I whoever was guarding whoever I, whoever set the pick for me, I ran to the corner. Their man switched on me, and Al set the, set a pick for I think JB. So that made him B switch, and JB ran to the other side of the court. So we wanted him B away from the basket. Yeah, and we knew. And once they switched, he was going to be on top of them. So he, all he said, all you got to do, Al, is seal them. And you'll be wide open. And, like, when it worked, just how he said it was going to work, I was like, wow. Like, <laughs> that was crazy. Like, everything worked exactly how he said it was going to work. And, I mean, it won us a game. That play was sick. I don't know. I've been I think this is his seventh year. And I think he's run, like, 200 out-of-bound plays at this point and like half of them either worked or should have worked or somebody missed a shot. But he's the first one I've ever seen do the one where it's the guys inbounding from mid court and he just throws to a spot in the corner and somebody actually runs and catches it like a football receiver and then turns and shoots. I'd never seen that before. And at the Celtics, I think have won games of that. I like the fact that it's not always who you maybe expect. Right. Is going to get the ball. It's just, who he, who he knows is going to be open. And it's been guys that sometimes would not play for 10 games, and then we have guys that are hurt, and they're playing, and he draws, draws out uh, out-of-bounds play for them, and they're wide open and hit the shot. Right. Um, we would have never thought he was going to draw it up for him. He does, like, one of the things he does, it seems like everybody feels like they're – they have skin in the game kind of on the team. Like Aaron Baines could end up shooting the biggest shot of the game in the corner. It's, it's, it just, <laughs> if you, if you're getting minutes, you might be involved in the biggest play of the game, basically, which I haven't seen a lot of coaches do. I think the NBA has gotten pretty predictable with the good teams where it's like, this guy's probably going to shoot. If he doesn't shoot, this guy's going to shoot. And then those are the two options. And, uh, he, uh, he's figured out a way to be a little more democratic about it. What are you most looking forward to this season? Uh, getting back to the playoffs. Playoffs are so much fun compared to the regular season. Yeah, uh, it's just a, it's like a different season, and it was just so much more intense, and I, it was just so much more fun to me. How long would you, if you could be in charge of the length of the NBA season? How long would, how many games would you have? Uh, I don't know. That's tough because less games we play, the less money we make. Right. I think everybody likes their paycheck. So I think you're going to do fine with money. <laughs> it's, so. it's all it's all coming. I think you're you're in good shape. Um, you had did so Hayward has got added. That's it for this year, right? They're no really new guy. The nucleus is back, but with Hayward. Yep. And potentially there's we didn't even talk about Jalen Brown. Potentially there's a Jalen Brown, Hayward, you, Horford, Kyrie five guys who can shoot threes line up out there. I'm excited for that one. Me too. Jalen Brown, are you buddies off the court or just on court running mates? No, we cool off the court. Yeah. Mm. Did you know him in the circles before? Yeah. Uh, we were, you know, he we was were, a year older. We were at camps together before he was my roommate at one camp. Uh, we were on a college visit together. Uh, so I do JB a couple years before the NBA. So you guys are kind of a team now. Yeah, we're the young guys. You're tandem. On the team. When anything bad happens, it's our fault. <laughs> That's one thing I noticed during the year. No matter what. So JB or JT. You so, didn't switch. It was your fault. If somebody else, man, got scored on, JB was in the wrong spot. Somebody <laughs> forgot to play, take me out the game. How hurt was he in the playoffs compared to what we knew as – Fans and media people. With his hamstring? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He wasn't faking it. Uh, no, no. Was he like 60%, 50%? It was hard to say because he was able to cheat and you could never tell. You knew he was hurt, but you could never tell how hurt he was. Yeah. Uh, I mean, JB is really tough. And uh, he, he was fighting through it. I remember the first, first, I think it was game two of Philly. First game he came back, uh, the first play he got in, he stole the ball and dunked it. Yeah, and then he was landing, and it seemed like he got hurt again. I remember that. Yeah, he was limping. Yeah. I was like, only you would go dunk the ball <laughs> your first play back. 
What's what's the Jalen Brown Marcus Smart relationship like? They always how much ball busting is involved with that combination? Yeah, those two guys always joking in the locker room. They always got something to say about the other person. And I mean they trying they being funny, but they they always mess with each other in the locker room, practice, on the bus, just whenever. Marcus competing at everything? Uh I don't know. It's like JB coming out the shower and Marcus to say somebody's toes. <laughs> something like that. Just anything. Are you guys playing are you guys playing cards on the on the plane and stuff? Uh or are you guys all too young? Our plane, from what I've heard, is the most chill plane in all of the NBA. Really? Yeah. Like there's no cards, no loud music. Everybody just put their headphones on, and go to sleep. That's it. When do you turn twenty one? Next next uh February, March? March third. And how old's your kid now? Eight and a half months. Oh, so crawling. Yeah, standing up. Standing Can't, up. He he'll stand up for like six seconds, then he'll fall. He can walk with a walker. Yeah. But uh he should be walking soon, really soon. Well, that's it's all over when they can start to walk. Yeah. It's fun when you can kind of put them in one spot and they can't really move, but when they can start walking over to like that cabinet over there and just knocking things over, it's fun for about two days. And then it's not fun at all when they start breaking stuff. Right. You, and he'll get to come to games this year. He you came to all the, the little, You got to put the little earplugs in. He came to all the home games last year. Oh, really? He just didn't know what was going on? Yeah, he was asleep for half the game. He didn't He didn't wear the headphones, though. He, he didn't like them, but the noise didn't bother him at all. Oh, that's good. Well, it's going to hurt your feelings when he picks another Celtic as his favorite player. So that yeah. seems to be a recurring theme with NBA players with kids. That would never happen. they pick happen. somebody on another team. So he ends up being like a Giannis fan or something. I won't allow that. Yeah, that. see, that's the attitude. I, my, my my son was like, LeBron's on the Lakers. I love LeBron. I'm like, not anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, 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 let's never discuss this again. It's not happening. What'd you name your son? Uh, Jason. But Jason, we call him Deuce, like the second. Nice. So his nickname is Deuce. Are you putting a senior on your jersey? No. Nah. Yeah. Keep it. Keep it the way it is. Yeah. It'll, it'll sell more without the senior. And you're Nike now, right? Uh. Uh-huh. When do you get a shoe? Soon, I hope. What would you want to call it? Air Tatum. No. Nah. The crossover. I should have workshopped some names before I got here. Uh, you don't have a nickname right, right? J Smooth. That's what they called me when I was at Duke. J Smooth. I like that nickname. J Smooth. All right. I'll try to get going. Um, so when does preseason start? Like Media three, day four weeks? Is 24th. First preseason game is the 28th. So you already worked on your, well, you know, we all got to gotta play minutes and <laughs> just got to handle like professionals. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to get back to the playoffs. That's, Got that whole thing down. It's the truth. Year two is a big year for NBA players. I'm looking forward to it. Me you too. Went, you went through, you hit all your you hit all your marks. You know what the rookie wall is like. You know what it's like to play in the different cities. Year two is always a, a big leap. Good luck. I'm excited for it. I'm excited too. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much to Ryan Rosillo. Thanks to Jason Tatum. Thanks to ZipRecruiter. Don't forget to go to ZipRecruiter.com slash BS and check out everything they have to offer. Thanks to Starbucks Double Shot. I wish I had one right now. Starts with bold Starbucks coffee, blended with milk for a smooth, creamy, delicious flavor, enhanced with ginseng, garan, and B vitamins. You know what you have when you when you drink one of these? More energy. You know what's good? More energy. Starbucks Double Shot. Energy to do the things you actually do. Find it in your local convenience store. Have a good weekend. Next week, maybe we're going to do over-unders with Sal. We'll see how it goes. Stay tuned for that. A couple other good guests in store. Enjoy the weekend. And don't forget to subscribe to the Ryan Rosillo podcast. Dual threat. It's happening. Launching next week. Until then.